All right, now we are in model three. The only difference between model two and model three is that now we have two consumers. That's it. Everything else is the same. Okay. Um, and the labor is still as an input and the leisure, the remaining of labor, therefore, gets into the utility function. So that's the assumption. So because of the similarity, as I said, the only difference is that we have two consumers. I'm not going to talk about model specific assumptions. It's exactly the same, but I'm going to talk directly about the, um, the numerical example specific assumptions. So here's the numerical example. So we have two consumers. I'm going to call them consumer A and B. Both agents have utilities over X and L. So there's a consumption good X and then the leisure uh, related as L. Um, well, here it's just an example. Uh, the utility of the agent A is again Cub Douglas of good X and the leisure. So the endowment of the labor is one for both agents. All right. So each agent has one unit of labor they bring to the market. Uh, agent A enjoys leisure, but agent B doesn't care about leisure. All right. So she doesn't have any utility out of leisure. Uh, you can put it as like she's workaholic in a sense. I mean, she doesn't care about how much labor or leisure she has. What she cares about is only good X. All right. Well, fine. We still have one firm and the firm produces uh, <clears throat> good X, which is the consumption good by using the labor. But this time the labor. So I have a notation F. So it F uh, corresponds to firm. So XF is how much firm produces XB, how much consumer wants uh, to consume, consumer B wants to consume a uh, good X. And so the LF is the total labor, which is going to be sum of LA plus LB, right? Well, this is what market clearing condition is. So the LF is how much the, uh, the, the, the labor, um, you know, the, the, the firm demands and LA plus LB is the how much supply uh, these consumers are going to supply, are going to supply. And so they have to be the same. So this is market clearance conditions. Obviously, I don't have to uh, insert this into my step one and step two. All right. So therefore, the firm produces XF mini good X by using LF mini of inputs according to this function. So it's again, decreasing returns to scale production function. As I said, each labor, each consumer has one unit of labor. 24 hours rather than 24. We just simplified as one. And then the consumer B owns the firm. So, so it matters because the, the firm is going to probably make revenue because the consumers want the firm make revenue because they're going to use that revenue, that, that money, and then purchase X in the market. And so here consumer B owns the firm. Consumer A owns nothing. All right. Um, Again, that's an example. You change the utility functions, you have another example. You change the production function, you have another example. You, ha you change the total amount of inputs. So rather than one, one agent has one unit of labor, the other agent has uh, you know, half a unit of labor, maybe because um, the, the second consumer um, is, is, is some, some, some other constraint. All right. Um, or you change the ownership of the firm 50, 50, one, one quarter, uh, three quarter. So that gives you a different question and different answer. All right. So here's one example, but the way we solve all of those examples will be exactly the same. So what is the methodology? We are looking for W divided by P. The W is the wage. P is the price for good X such that first, the firm chooses uh, its supply optimally um, and, and the consumers choose their demand optimally. And then the, the market clears. There's no excess demand and no excess supply. All right. So here the uh, step one, step one, uh, the firm's problem, firm's problem. Well, the firm's problem here is exactly the same as in the other video. Um, but I don't remember it. And so I'm going to solve it, but I'm going to be quicker because I solved it already in my previous video. So if you remember the profit of the firm is 
uh, x times px, this is how much, well, just p, this is how much revenue it's going to make, minus uh, w times lf. So now you have to be very clear about the notation. So right, this is not la, all right? The firm is going to use lf mini labor, all right? So uh, be careful about the, uh, oh, this is also XF, all right? So let's be clear about the notation. But the prices are the same. P is the same across all agents. And W is uh, same. I mean, the firm hires the same price and then the consumers get exactly the same wage, all right? So there's no tax, for example. There's no price distortions. All right, so this is revenue minus cost subject to the constraint, which is xf equals lf square root, all right? So if you remember, I said lf is equal to xf squared, and so the profit becomes xfp minus w xf squared. So the first order condition with respect to, I mean, the derivative with respect to xf is equal to p minus 2w xf equals zero, Hence, the total number of xf is going to be p divided by 2w. You don't need to write supply demand here because I use a different notation xa, xb, xf for all agents. So you don't have to worry about supply demand. But this is uh, a supply, obviously. Uh, you know, if you like, because this is uh, the firm's problem, this is the supply. All right, well... What is the LF? Uh, so this is the demand, right? So it's the square of this. So P squared divided by 4W squared. And this is demand. And if you remember, the profit was, what was it really? So this time P uh, minus uh, this time W. So it was P squared divided by 4W squared. All right. So that was the profit. Let me check. Yes. Okay. Very well, step one is done. Step two, we somewhat did step two in the previous question, but if you remember the consumer A is the same agent in my model two, but he owned the firm. Now he doesn't own the firm. So things are different for that reason. So I have to solve everything again. So consumer, so I'm gonna solve the consumer A's problem first. So what is her utility function, X, uh, X A, uh, L, A. So it's X, A, one minus L, A. So we like to maximize this subject to the budget constraint. So what is the budget constraint of the consumer? The expenditure, X, A times P. So this is how much she's going to spend on good X. She's not going to spend anything on labor, but instead she's going to get uh, labor income and she doesn't have a uh, profit so I don't have pi in appearing in her budget constraint all right so this is her budget constraint that's it very simple well how do I do that well whenever I see um, you know la just write x a p divided by w all right so therefore to maximize u is going to be basically maximize this thing x a times uh, 1 minus x a p divided by w so the if you take the derivative of this thing with respect to x a and set it equal to zero you're going to have uh, so this is the function that i'm taking derivative with respect to x a so if you distribute this so it's x a minus x a squared p over w. So the derivative is going to be 1 minus 2 x a p over w equals 0. So therefore, x a is going to be w divided by 2 p. All right. And once again, this is demand. Well, given that, what is L a? We already know that it's equal to x a times p over w. So the p over w as you see, they're going to cancel out. So it's x a divided by 2. This is how much uh, labor she's going to supply. Okay? So she's going to supply basically half of uh, her consumption of good x. All right. Well, uh, this is consumer A. Consumer B. Well, consumer B is, I think, simple because 
maximize u of b, uh, which is just xb, subject to budget constraint. So let's write the budget constraint. Expenditure, p times xb, how much money she's going to spend on uh, consuming a good x. She doesn't spend money on labor, but the labor is always an income. So this is wlb. And she owns the entire company and therefore the profit. All right, so the profit should enter here. The pi is... Is, is, is independent of XB and, and, and LB, so therefore I can treat it as a constant. So what I'm gonna do is the following. Well, if this is my utility function that I'm trying to maximize subject to this constraint, well, you don't take any derivative here, right? If you take the derivative, its derivative is one, um, right? Um, so don't take derivative, this is a linear function, right? So U of B, so this is XB, this is u of b, so it's something like this. If xb is zero, her utility is zero. If xb increases, her utility will increase. So therefore, she's going to get the highest possible xb she can get. The highest possible xb is this. So therefore, uh, her optimal xb, the consumption on xb, therefore is, without any optimization problem, it's just wlb divided by uh, uh, xb. Ugh, what am I doing? I'm sorry. Um, so the, the W times LB divided by uh, plus pi divided by P. Well, here though, uh, it, it's not really a demand curve because it depends on LB. LB is, is, is how much labor she's going to supply. But as you see, she doesn't care about LB. Uh, because it's it's not into her utility function. So what is the maximum amount of LB she can choose, right? The maximum utility by choosing XB and LB. So what, so you're choosing not only XB, but also LB. So what is the highest LB and therefore highest XB you can get when LB is equal to one, right? So therefore, this guy, because he gets no utility out of leisure or no disutility out of labor, should spend all, I mean, should basically work 24 hours. So that means her optimal demand is W plus pi divided by P. All right, so LB has to be equal to one. So clear? So this is, again, sometimes the simpler max optimization problems may be more confusing. Let me repeat. So this consumer is maximizing her utility, which is just XB, by choosing XB and LB. So how much X consume and how much labor to supply. However, she doesn't care about L, so she should, and the more L she puts, she's going to get, right, if, if you increase L, the, the, the right-hand side will increase, and therefore the left-hand side will increase as well. So for the highest possible XB, she should be, choosing the highest possible LB. And therefore, her optimal labor supply is going to be one. I mean, she's going to supply all of her labor. Remember, everyone has only one unit of labor, 24 hours. And she's going to consume this many uh, good X. And so this is demand. All right. So that's it. That's step two. Now, step three. And then the step three says, oh, the supply and demand must be the same for both markets. And here, it, it doesn't matter which market you pick. Um, step three, let's pick one of the markets. Um, okay, I still have time. So I'm gonna pick uh, labor. So the LF, the demand, has to be equal to supply for labor, uh, LA plus LB. So what is LF? It's P squared divided by 4W squared equals to LA, which is XA over 2, and then LB, which is 1. All right? So, um, I'm sorry. Yes. So LA is equal to XA divided by 2, which is obviously... Uh, I am sorry. There is no XA here. So, yeah, that's silly of me. So LA is equal to XA, which is W over 2P times P over W. So the W over P will cancel out. So it's just one half. 
I do make such idiotic mistakes oftentimes. And unfortunately, there's no one who can correct me. Um, so anyway, so uh, it's one health plus one. And so this is uh, three over two. And then what do I have? I have P squared divided by four squared equals to uh, three over two. And then hence P over W is equal to squared of three over two, all right? If you remember in the previous example, I think it was squared of three divided by two, something like this. So the price ratio will be different, but fine. This is the price ratio. By the way, just to make sure that the market will also clear um, in the, in the uh, good X market. So XF, this is the supply, has to be equal to XA plus XB because there's no initial endowment for good X. All right. For that reason, this is a supply, this is demand. So XF is, so I realized that I made, um, you know, a bunch of uh, mistakes uh, here. Uh, they're not fundamental, but uh, once I try to figure out the market clearance for the second good, I realized that the mistakes that I did. So the first mistake is the profit. Uh, well, the profit is, again, this thing times P. So it's P squared divided by 2w minus w times this. So this w square will cancel out. So it's going to be p squared divided by 4w. So it's therefore p squared divided by 4w, not w squared. Right? That's mistake number one. And then the second mistake is here. This is 3 over 2. And this 4, this is not going to be 3 over 2. It's going to be 6, uh, my idiot friend. Uh, well, happens, so it's squared of six, therefore, all right? So now let's check this. I hope this time I don't have any other mistake, uh, but that's a good thing. So XF is P divided by two W uh, equals to XA, which is W divided by two P plus XB, which is W over P uh, plus pi over P, so pi divided by P. So it's P divided by 4W. So this thing is equal to 3W divided by P. And I can send this thing to this side as negative. So this is going to be therefore P divided by 4W. Oh God, I'm, I'm, <laughs> yes, so this is 3W divided by 2. Okay, so what I have, if I do the cross product, I'm going to have P squared divided by W squared equals to this 4 and 2 cancels out. So it's going to be 6. So P divided by W is squared of 6. So yes, the market clears and the price, in both markets clear and the price ratio must be the same. And I can definitely use uh, this price ratio to calculate supply and the demand for all these goods. All you have to do is just plug this here. So it's going to be square root of 6 divided by 2. So this is going to be 6 divided by 4 and etc. So here, whatever that is. All right. So I'm just leaving as is because apparently I'm making lots of mistakes. Uh, but everything is true now. Um, so this is how we solve once we have two consumers. As I said, the only difference is that I am solving the consumer's problem twice because I have two consumers. All right. Um, I hope that was clear.